35-year-old Helen Caldwell lived in Chicago in 1992. She had recently moved from New Jersey and was due to start at Lutheran General Hospital. On November 8, 1992, Helen's sister and brother-in-law came to visit her, but when they entered her room at the Leaning Tower YMCA in Cook County, they discovered her lifeless body. She had been strangled. Investigators collected DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the person who took her life. Detectives worked the case until 1993, but it went cold due to a lack of investigation leads. In late 2020, investigators reopened the case, submitting numerous pieces of evidence to the Northeastern Illinois Regional Crime Laboratory in Vernon Hills. The DNA of those samples matched the DNA of Richard J. Sisto. Sisto lived close to Helen at the time her life was taken and he was on parole for a 1977 assault case in Dallas, Texas. Investigators had trouble finding him after the DNA match in late 2020. Then, in August of 2021, a police database search revealed that Sisto was in jail in Texas on a 2006 parole violation warrant. Cook County detectives then traveled to Texas where they interviewed Sisto and took a DNA sample. After more DNA tests, it was confirmed that he was indeed the one who took Helen's life. Sisto was later brought back to Illinois to face the charges against him. At the public announcement, Helen's sister, Noka Irvin, spoke. I'm so grateful they decided to reopen this case and I just appreciate everyone's effort in solving it. The 72-year-old sister was taken to Cook County Jail on November 24, 2021. Unfortunately, he passed away in late January 2022. The cause has not been revealed yet. If you like this content, subscribe my channel. We are very close to 1,000 subscribers. Let's continue the video. 21-year-old Pradhana EBS lived in Inglewood, California in 2005. On April 26, Pradhana's body was found lying in a carport in Gardenia, California. Someone backing out of one of the four stalls in the carport discovered her. The medical examiner determined that she had been strangled. Investigators found fingerprints on Pradhana's purse that did not belong to her, along with DNA from a man at the crime scene. They theorized that it belonged to the person who ended her life. However, technology at the time was not advanced enough for them to identify the culprit and with no other useful leads, the case went cold. In 2021, investigators revisited Pradhana's case, resubmitting forensic evidence from the crime scene using new technology. This led them to 56-year-old Charles Wright, who was arrested on January 27, 2022. Wright denied involvement in the crime, claiming that his fingerprints on Pradhana's purse were there because he had sold it to her. According to him, he was selling purses, tennis shoes, and clothing from the trunk of his car at the time. Wright, who had been working as a teacher since 1999, stated that he resigned from the Inglewood Unified School District to fight the case against him, vehemently denying any wrongdoing. He said, I didn't do this. Everybody that knows me knows that I used to sell bags and clothes out of my car. That's the only possible way it could happen. In a letter dated Saturday, County Administrator Erica F. Torres, head of Inglewood Unified, informed staff and parents that the district learned of the accusation the day before and that Wright would no longer be teaching at any of its schools. Wright is scheduled for arraignment on June 28, 2022. What you think about it? Tell us your thoughts and comments below. 23-year-old Krista Bramlett lived in New Providence, Tennessee in 1996. Residing in a mobile home, she faced financial struggles while raising two very young children. Her kids went to live with her mother in Corpus Christi, Texas, while Krista remained, hoping to complete her GED program. The surrounding area deteriorated, marked by increasing crime, including business burglaries and drug-related offenses. Unfortunately, Krista became a victim of the problems facing New Providence. On the afternoon of October 8, 1996, Krista's landlord knocked on the door of her mobile home in Sunnydale Mobile Home Park just off Peachers Mill Road. Nobody answered, prompting the landlord to look inside where he discovered Krista's lifeless body. She had suffered throat injuries and an autopsy confirmed she had been suffocated with evidence of indecent assault. Investigators collected male DNA from her body, sending it to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations lab to create a DNA profile. Despite submitting the profile into the combined DNA index system, no matches could be made, only confirming that the DNA belonged to a black male. With no other leads, the case went cold. 
On February 13, 2019, Clarksville Police Department Detective Michael Orr received the awaited news. The DNA in the combined DNA index system matched a man living in Phoenix, Arizona, identified as 48-year-old Kenneth Hudspeth. Hudspeth had not surfaced in the investigation until then and was not on anyone's radar. In April 2019, Detective Orr interviewed Hudspeth, confirming he was in Clarksville at the time of Krista's death. Hudspeth admitted knowing Krista and claimed to be the last person to see her alive. Arrested and charged based on the DNA evidence and interview, investigators reviewed Hudspeth's arrest record, revealing multiple arrests for charges like domestic assault and felony assault. Despite spending time in Arizona and Texas prisons, his DNA had not been collected earlier. In June 2019, Hudspeth appeared in Montgomery County Court for the first time. The trial took place in September 2021, where half of the three-hour interview with Detective Ori was presented to the jurors. Hudspeth, claiming drug use during that period, couldn't recall if he assaulted or took Krista's life, but hoped he did not. DNA evidence placed him at the crime scene. On September 24, 2021, after four days of testimony, Kenneth Hudspeth was found guilty of all charges. In January 2022, the 51-year-old Hudspeth received a life sentence plus 20 years for his crimes. Nine-year-old Carolyn Johnson lived in Tampa, Idaho in 1982. At 8 a.m. on February 21st, she was walking six blocks from her home to Lincoln Elementary School but never made it there. Three days later, fishermen found her body in a drainage alongside the Snake River. She had been indecently assaulted and drowned. Mail was collected and DNA was gathered from the crime scene. In March 1983, police questioned Charles Fame, whose hair resembled samples found on the body. He owned a car similar to the one seen at the crime scene and lived a block away from the Johnson family. Fame denied any involvement, passed a polygraph test, but was charged with the crimes nonetheless. During Fame's trial, prosecutors mentioned a shoe print near the body that could have been his. Two jailhouse informants testified they heard Fame admit to the crime, receiving reduced sentences for their testimony. Fame claimed he was hundreds of miles away at the time and other witnesses corroborated his alibi. The judge didn't permit the polygraph test results as evidence and the DNA found inside the body couldn't rule him out due to less advanced technology. On November 4, 1983, Fame was convicted and in March 1984, he was sentenced to death. For nearly two decades, Fame sat behind bars in isolation for up to 23 hours a day. In 1991, he was days away from execution, but it was postponed. In 1999, advanced DNA testing revealed that the hairs and DNA found on Carolyn's body did not belong to Fame but to an unknown man. He was then exonerated. In August 1999, Fame was released from the Idaho Maximum Security Institution. In 2019, investigators revisited the case. In 2020, using genetic genealogy, they identified 64-year-old David Dalrymple as responsible. The hair and DNA found at the crime scene matched him. Dalrymple was serving a 20-to-life prison sentence for kidnapping and abusing a child in 2004. After more investigative work and DNA testing, Dalrymple was formally charged with taking Carolyn's life in January 2022. Charles Fame, now doing well, received $1,400,000 for the wrongful conviction and recently bought a truck. While it doesn't compensate for losing nearly two decades of his life, justice prevailed as Dalrymple faces another life sentence, if not the death penalty. What you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. 20-year-old Sophie Sergi lived in Pitkus Point, Alaska, in 1993. On April 25th, she went to visit a friend at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The last time Sophie was seen was when she left her group of friends to smoke a cigarette outside. The next morning, a janitor found Sophie's body in a dormitory bathtub. She had been stabbed multiple times, shot in the back of the head, and indecently assaulted. Investigators collected evidence from the crime scene, including male DNA from Sophie's body. They also interviewed Sophie's friends and others in the dorm or at the university who might have information. Unfortunately, investigators could not find a substantial lead and the case went cold. In 2019, investigators revisited the case, leveraging more advanced DNA technology. They took the DNA from the unknown man collected from Sophie's body and submitted it to a public DNA database, finding a relative of the suspect, believed to be his aunt. She had uploaded a sample to a commercial online genealogy database. 
The man they suspected, 47-year-old Stephen Downs, was located in 2018. Investigators executed a search warrant at his home in Auburn, Maine, collecting a DNA sample that matched the one from the crime scene in 1993. He was promptly arrested and Downs' trial began in January 2022. During the trial, jurors heard from witnesses who were at the dorm on the night of the crime, forensic experts, and law enforcement. Downs, a freshman at the university in 1993, lived in the dorm where Sophie's life was taken. Witnesses testified that Downs owned guns, including a 22 caliber pistol which matched the bullet used to shoot Sophie. Downs did not testify, but jurors heard a recording of his conversation with investigators where he denied knowing Sophie and having a gun in his dorm room. The girlfriend testified that Downs had left the room several times that evening when the crime occurred. In closing statements, Prosecutor Janet Bernstein emphasized Downs's DNA found at the scene and dismissed alternative suspects raised by the defense. The jury deliberated for days before reaching a verdict on February 8, 2022. Downs was found guilty of both charges. Prosecutor Jenna Gerstein expressed gratitude for holding Downs accountable after almost 30 years, hoping for closure for Sophie's family and the Fairbanks community. Downs' attorney, James Halanik, mentioned disappointment with the verdict and indicated a likely appeal, raising questions about the use of genetic genealogy in this case, a relatively new and controversial science in law enforcement. Downs is held without bail and is scheduled to be sentenced in September, facing a maximum prison sentence of 129 years. Nine-year-old Maurice Chivarella lived with her family in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, in 1964. On March 18th, she left her home early to deliver canned goods to a nun before attending class at St. Joseph's Parochial School. During her half-mile walk, Maurice disappeared. When marked absent from school and not returning home for lunch, her family reported her missing to the police. That afternoon, Morris's body was discovered two miles away in a strip mining pit near the Hazleton Municipal Airport. Her wrists and ankles were bound by her shoelaces and her scarf was stuffed in her mouth. She had been indecently assaulted and strangled. Investigators collected DNA belonging to an unknown man from the crime scene, preserving it for future use. In 2007, they created a DNA profile of the suspect from the sample, submitting it to the combined DNA index system, but no matches were found. Undeterred, investigators persisted comparing the DNA profile to the growing database each month. In 2019, their persistence paid off when they found a distant relative of the suspect. From 2019 to 2021, authorities conducted numerous interviews and collected DNA samples from this family, narrowing it down to four suspects. James Paul Forte, with a criminal history, caught investigators' attention. He was not part of the 1964 investigation and had passed away in 1980 at the age of 38. With the assistance of the Luzerne County District Attorney's Office, investigators exhumed Forte's body to obtain his DNA sample. In February 2022, after more DNA testing, they confirmed that he was responsible for taking Morris's life. The chance of another person having the same DNA profile was 1 in 480 septillion. Police revealed that Forte had been arrested in Hamilton in 1974 on similar charges with a different victim and later arrested in 1978 for reckless endangerment and harassment. Authorities urged anyone with information to come forward, suggesting there may be other crimes not yet known. Marie Chivarella's case was the oldest cold case in Pennsylvania and the fourth oldest case in America to be solved with genetic genealogy. Morris's brother, Ronald Chivarella, attended the press conference, expressing a sense of closure, knowing the individual responsible isn't out committing similar crimes. Forte lived only blocks away from the Chivarellas and authorities believe the attack was random. Maurice Chivarella would be 67 years old today. What you think about it? Tell us your thoughts and comments below. 30-year-old Roxanne Leawood lived in Barron County, Michigan, with her husband Terry Wood. On February 20, 1987, the two went bowling, each in their separate cars. Roxanne left the bowling alley first, and when Terry arrived home later, he discovered her lifeless body on the kitchen floor, her throat slit. DNA belonging to the suspect was collected at the crime scene. Initially, Terry became a suspect, but investigators found no evidence linking him to the crime. The DNA found did not match his, and the technology at the time couldn't identify the unknown suspect. 
In 2001, the Michigan State Police's 5th District Cold Case Team worked on the case for over a year, reviewing thousands of pages of information and evidence, but it did not lead to a suspect and the case went cold again. In 2020, investigators reopened the case. In February 2021, a credible and reliable tip led them to 67-year-old Patrick Wayne Gillum, living in South Bend, Indiana. In June 2021, investigators collected a cigarette but with Gillum's DNA which matched the unknown DNA from the crime scene. Police brought Gillum in for an interview during which he denied going to Michigan for any reason other than work. He claimed not to know anyone named Brockhan and when shown a photo of Roxanne, he said he did not know her. However, upon hearing what happened to Roxanne, Gillum's demeanor changed and he requested a lawyer terminating the interview. On February 17, 2022, Gillum was arrested in connection to the case at his home on East Bowman Street. A neighbor mentioned Gillum's recent good deeds like shoveling her sidewalk after a snowstorm. Gillum's bond was set at $500,000 and if posted, he must wear a tracker and stay in a residence in Michigan. He will appear in court for a preliminary examination. Lieutenant Chuck Christensen expressed relief at the arrest and mentioned ongoing investigative work. He spoke with Roxanne's husband Terry and her family who were happy and thankful for the breakthrough. After 35 years since the incident, they are processing the relief that progress has finally been made in the case. 20-year-old Mary Jane Thompson lived in Dallas, Texas in 1984. Having previously resided in Houston and Los Angeles, she decided to move to Dallas in 1983. Mary worked at a flower shop and a restaurant, nurturing dreams of becoming a model. On February 11, 1984, she was last seen taking a bus to a medical clinic. Two days later, her lifeless body was discovered behind a warehouse in Dallas. She had been strangled by her own leg warmers and assaulted. DNA belonging to the culprit was collected from the scene for later use. In 2009, a DNA profile was created for the suspect, but it did not match anyone in the database and the case went cold. In 2018, Dallas police decided to reopen the case, leveraging more advanced DNA technology. They collaborated with a team from the district attorney's office and the FBI. The DNA profile of the suspect was submitted to public DNA databases. Finally, in February 2021, investigators determined that 60-year-old Edward Morgan's DNA matched the DNA collected at the crime scene in 1984. Morgan was arrested and is currently being held at the Dallas County Jail. Dallas County Assistant District Attorney Leighton De Atone expressed the collaborative effort in solving challenging cold cases and the commitment to utilizing advancements in forensic testing techniques. Mary's sister, Celine Tomasello, posted several messages and a montage of family photos on Facebook after the arrest. She expressed a mix of emotions, missing her sister and acknowledging the long wait for justice, stating that the perpetrator will be in jail for the rest of his life. 79-year-old Viola Hagen Court lived alone in an apartment in Anaheim, California, in 1980. On February 18, 1980, a concerned neighbor who often saw Viola walking around the apartment complex hadn't seen her for two days. The neighbor entered Viola's unit and tragically found her lifeless body. Viola had been assaulted and strangled. Despite detectives' efforts over the years to solve the case, pursuing leads and evidence, they failed to identify a suspect and the case went cold. In September 2020, the case was reopened and investigators turned to genetic genealogy, a technique that has been successful in solving numerous cases across the U.S. DNA found on Viola was compared with genetic profiles on genealogy databases, leading investigators to 64-year-old Andre William Le Perry. He was arrested on April 28, 2021, at his home in Alamogordo, New Mexico, in connection to the case. Le Perry is being held without bail at a Notaro County Jail. There is no belief that Andre and Viola knew each other. Viola's family expressed their feelings in a statement describing Viola as a beautiful, happy soul who did not deserve such violation in her final years. They expressed gratitude for the Anaheim Police Department's unwavering dedication over 41 years, emphasizing the message never to give up. Le Perry was in his 20s at the time of the crime and lived close to Viola in Anaheim. In the 1990s, he moved east, splitting his time between Arizona and New Mexico, working as a plumber and truck driver. He had two marriages and two children. Investigators had not established a motive for the crime. 
In February 2022, Le Pere was convicted of the crime and he is scheduled to be sentenced on May 13. Th, what you think about it? Tell us your thoughts and comments below. 18-year-old Anita Knutson lived in Minot, North Dakota in 2007. Described as tenacious, kind, and compassionate, she had just completed her first year at Minot State University studying elementary education. Anita was working two jobs to pay for school and shared an off-campus apartment with her roommate, Nicole Rice. Anita's mother, Sharon Knutson, last spoke to her on June 1, 2007. When Anita didn't answer her phone for several days, her father, Gordon, drove to her apartment. Concerned, Gordon sought help from the landlady and maintenance worker after finding a removed window screen. The maintenance man recalled the screen from Anita's bedroom window. Looking through the window, Gordon discovered Anita's lifeless body on her bed. He called 911 and officers arrived at 5.12 p.m. Anita had been stabbed multiple times and a large housecoat covered her body. A small pocket knife with dried blood was found on the bed and Anita's belongings were undisturbed, ruling out robbery as a motive. The window screen had been cut after the crime, likely to mislead investigators. Investigators interviewed Anita's neighbors and construction workers nearby, collecting DNA samples from those they interviewed. Anita's roommate, Nicole Rice, initially claimed she was with her family all weekend, but inconsistencies in her story raised suspicions. Friends reported that Anita and Rice often fought, describing Rice as hot-tempered and reactionary. Anita's mother claimed Anita was scared of Rice, who allegedly sent threatening messages. Minot Police Chief John Clunk named Rice as a suspect but lacked sufficient evidence for an arrest, leading to the case going cold for years. In 2022, the Minot Police Department re-interviewed suspects and witnesses collaborating with the true crime show Cold Justice for additional support. During the renewed effort, investigators discovered that Rice had dated a man in 2008 to 2009. The man claimed Rice confessed to taking Anita's life when drunk, but she became angry when questioned sober. On March 16, 2022, Rice was arrested at Minot Air Force Base, where she worked. She was released on a $120,000 bond and scheduled to appear in court on April 21st. Chief Klung expressed sympathy for the family and relief at having the person responsible in custody. If you like this content, subscribe my channel. We are very close to 1,000 subscribers.